Hey everybody, welcome to a, another episode of the Plotaholics Do what Interviews. Is, oh, I thought I thought we decided we were gonna name us what are we doing? Uh, uh we were we were gonna name it whatever this is. Yeah, the Plotaholics <laughs> presents whatever this is. Yeah, and today Ew. today, Brian, this is a very special interview. I, I am so excited right about now that I could probably hang from my ceiling with just my toes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it is a uh, it's a big day here on uh, the Plotaholics. Can I give a hint? Have, Can I give a hint? You give a hint. I feel like the answers. I feel like the answer is in the title. But go ahead. No, I want to <laughs> give hints. All right, uh, that's right, Mr. Tan. Today we welcome in the uh, one and only Arlene Sedaris. Arlene, welcome. Hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> royalty. Yeah, royalty for sure. Oh, oh, absolutely. Oh, I think so. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Great <laughs> intro. And I love Plotaholics. I, oh. I like that. Time, so. Well, thank well you we, so much. we love you. We love you and your work. Oh, thank you. So thank much. You so much. Oh, uh, thank you. We've talked now to, we officially, Brian, have tic tac toe for Andy Sedaris films. Yes, uh, we do. In that we've had interviewed now three people that have been involved with those films. Not, um, to, mention, not to mention the Queen of the <laughs> the um the the Sed the Sedaris universe that's right oh my God. uh so uh the thing that that lisa and donna both said uh that struck me is that uh, arlene you had such an influence on the stories of these movies and that a lot of the feminine or like a lot of the feminist undertones are thanks to you could you speak to that a little bit yes it makes me very proud 30 years later <laughs> to to um, be recognized in that way because I did protect the girls and there was the nudity you know before I did the, the, these twelve films I was I produced Hardy Boys Nancy Drew and mm. and you know every week um, somebody from either the network or the or the studio would say can you make them a little sexier you know and we had gotten my partner Joyce Brotman and I had gotten the, the rights from Harry. Um, Harriet Adams, who is the daughter of the man who created all of those books. And we have an obligation to, to, to set certain standards. And um, we couldn't make them sexier. <laughs> we couldn't have love affairs and all that stuff. But all of those people who were constantly encouraging us to make them sexier, when I started doing these movies, they went, oh, you're doing those movies. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And, um, and now those movies are so tame compared to what you see everywhere. Um, they're, they're sexy, but there's no, there's no graphic sex. There's no graphic violence. And except in one, in one scene, one word in the 12 films was, was said that's off color. And, um, and we left in it because it was funny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I did protect the girls and, and Andy, who was such an outrageous kind of person. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Roberta Vasquez was uh, told the story about he, she met him and he opened the door to, because we interviewed the girls at our house and they were cautioned about, you know, that didn't sound quite right and be careful. And, and this man would open up the door and here's this kind of stocky guy with his, it, you know, it was, it was the, the, uh, the 80s. So his shirt was, unbuttoned to the waist and there was a gold chain and <laughs> he was this outrageous kind of guy. And then I would be walking up behind him and, and that would give her a great sigh of relief <laughs> to know that there was a woman around and hopefully that woman would protect her. And I did. I'm very proud to say I did. I did protect the girls. One of the things that I love about these movies, especially early on is just how off the walls bonkers some of the action and, and some of the ideas are, I wonder, uh, Arlene, uh, how much did you have to 
to wrangle Andy on some of these ideas? I absolutely never wrangled him. He had an outrageous sense of humor and these ideas would come to him. I mean, living with him was like that as well. <laughs> but, um, you know, he was just funny. You know, he just had a funny way of looking at things. And um, so, no, wrangling his ideas never. But as far as where my contribution was in, in keeping the, the schedules and the budget and, and all of that, and, you know, once we started and we were dealing with the cast and crew, there was a good cop and a bad cop. And who do you think was the bad cop? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, so basically you had to be the mom that sort yeah. of kept everything together. Yeah, I did. I, and if somebody was, was in, and if somebody got in trouble, it's like Arlene wants to see you. <laughs> well, yeah, a little bit of that. A little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, that's an office I don't want to go to. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go. I don't want to get called well, to office, Arlene. I, uh, yeah, I have an office. Every now and then I have an office. <laughs> <laughs> well, your office was the beach. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, we got um, Yeah, we did. Uh, run by the, by the seat of our pants everywhere and we were you know very unconventional in in terms of the structure of the of the company why well, even think for the time you know a lot of your stories were very unconventional and we talked about this with donna and with um with lisa as well how the men just took the back seat to the women and everything and the men were some of the most inept individuals <laughs> they, they could yeah, <laughs> Yeah, I, you know what? I, yep. I will say they, they were some straight up 80s handsome. Absolutely. But <laughs> they knew who the bosses were. That's right. And so that that was very unconventional. And that, that's the one thing that I love about these movies even now is that I guess because I noticed I know that when feminism really started coming into a bigger forefront in the 2000s and the 2010s. You know, a lot of people were having this negative idea of it because it's like, well, now, you know, it's like, so what? We can't give compliments or we're just useless. And it's like, no, but you still got to show a monicum of respect. So one of my questions that I have with that is that did you ever have any actors, male actors that you sort of had to call them out to let them know you're going to be respectful here? of your co-stars no i don't I, you know there were some romances that i kind of kept my eyes closed to you know actors on location they think they're at summer camp so you know, <laughs> that's just how how it is but but as far as the respect there was only one incident where a um an ad screamed at the um the wardrobe person uh, and screamed obscenities at her. Um, it was, you know, and, and what I, my instinct was to fire him that day. And I did. And, and he was a friend and he was a real good help to the company, but that was my instinct. I, you know, I regretted it afterwards. I think I could have handled it better than I did, but, but it was, it was, it was awful. And, you know, anyway, so yeah, that was, the, that's the only time that there was anything in front of me that happened wow, i heard about other things but um i wonder <laughs> i wonder arlene if you could talk a little bit about how um this whole endeavor even came about like what what is it how did how did yeah, was how, it how andy's did andy, idea yeah how did, did andy come to you and say i want to make these movies <laughs> oh no he never he never asked for permission from me for <laughs> you, you just came home one day and you were like did we just sell our house so that we could make these movies <laughs> well no he he made um he did something with roger corman um and he just had this idea he, he, the thought of him going into a studio office with a script up under his arm was just not something that he could do you know, he just, you know, he was Andy Sedaris and, and that, uh, you know, he was, a, a, even at the beginning of his career, he started, you know, he, he accepted the first Emmy award for ABC sports, um, on behalf of, of all the directors, but he was the one 
Um, and he was the first man to take the, the camera off the field because his background was journalism and he wanted to tell the full story. Um, so what started for him was that when we saw the movie um, um, Cinema Paradiso, I don't know if you remember that movie, but it's the story of a little boy who um, somehow is in the projectionist's room during the, the showing of a movie. And he, this, this young man becomes a very successful director. And when we saw the movie, Andy said, that was me, because his uncle, who lived in Kansas City, and Andy grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana. In the summer times, he used to visit his uncle, and his uncle owned a couple of theaters. And he, he would accompany uh, his uncle when he went around to the theaters to collect. And he would sit in the projectionist's room. And um, and actually, those movies happened to be um, black exploitation movies. So I guess he got the idea about women being being the, the heroes of, of films. And also, he was he was raised by a, a widowed immigrant, Greek immigrant mother, um, and and he had a lot of respect for her um, and what she went through, and and that lasted. And he was he was a, a quite a, a respectful man to women. So that's, that's kind of his. In uh, a much so, so you made two movies, right? And, and then you got picked up for distribution by Warner Brothers, or how did that whole relationship yeah, start? Yeah, it was strange. No, there were two films that were done with Lorimar when Lorimar eventually was, was folded into Warner Brothers. And then um, there was an agent um, who made a deal for us with Columbia, which then became Sony, um, for four films. And they and the only requirement was that they had to be over 90 minutes and in color. That was mm -hmm. the deal. We didn't have to go to them for casting or script approval or anything. Wow. Um, and but we we weren't getting paid until we delivered. So that's well, even before then, we had our our house up as collateral. And that's actually how we went into business together because I had been I had produced before for television, but but really. Um, helped by being in the studio the, the capacity. Um, so Andy was was committed to do this one film and he had a couple he had some pre licensing and he was hiring people and making deals and ready to go ahead and about two weeks before he was to start principal photography, the bank said, we won't lend you the money without collateral, even though he had those those uh, licenses so the only collateral was our house and that's and I said if you're gonna put up our house as collateral then I'm gonna sign the checks <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah that was um, yeah because he was such a forceful person that um, I just I just thought he needed somebody to lean him in a little bit financially right <laughs> not, not spiritually <laughs> but financially <laughs> So um, that, that's, that was the romantic beginning of our relationship. <laughs> and that first movie, we, we nearly killed each other, but, but we got over it. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, it was and, a real eye opener to work together that time. And that was, was that for Malibu Express? No, I didn't produce Malibu Express. Okay. Um, yeah, but no, it's hard to get. Hard and that's it. and that's my favorite. I, I'm still singing that theme song, like I, just at random. Oh, you know that it's going to be coming out on uh, on, on on CDs. We, we're, I'm in the process of making a deal. No. <laughs> like that. Do, and what is what is the deal on on that? Is it going to be all of the theme songs? No, I think it's just hard ticket music from Hard Ticket. Yes, uh, I yes. know. Isn't that crazy? I am. I I seriously will just be sitting here at random. And just go. It's a hard ticket to Hawaii. And it is. It's <laughs> it's so my favorite catchy. song from the movies. But I loved that yeah. there was like a theme song. We talked about this on our episode about Hard Ticket. That all of the movies kind of had this like almost like your like James the Everyman's James Bond, right? Yeah. Uh, Every and, movie had a theme song central to the plot in somehow, <laughs> some way. <laughs> it's so great. I'm I'm wondering, Arlene, is because there's 
the the Abilene family is present in all of these movies, and all of those guys are terrible shots. I wonder is there was Andy throwing shade at somebody in real life? Was there really a Abilene that he was like he either honoring like or? <laughs> <laughs> Word. No, it wasn't. But he, he could have been a, you know, presaging my uh, firearm ability. <laughs> <laughs> and I, really, and I just I just went for firearm instruction, and the gun that I that I was given to use, I couldn't I I couldn't pull the trigger. <laughs> it was I'm, too I'm, difficult. I'm like okay. that was. I gotta get another gun. I'm like that with shotguns. When I when I first fired oh. a shotgun, I literally missed the broadside of a barn. It's like, yeah, I should put this <laughs> down. Oh man. Uh, so when all right, so in the one scene in Hard Ticket to Hawaii, when they blow up the jeep, and the sex doll just goes flying. What was your whose idea was that? And how hard did you roll your eyes? Oh my god, I rolled my eyes from morning to night with it. Who's living with this man for forty years? <laughs> <laughs> Plus, uh, really, I mean, he was, he was insane, uh, you know, out of the blue. He would just be crazy. Everything, everything was his idea. And in fact, when we uh, screened that film for the MPAA, they first gave us an R, I mean, an X, because they thought that the, the blow up doll looked too real. What? Wow. <laughs> well, these are the same people that threatened to give an X rating for um, Linnea Quigley dancing in Return of the Living Dead. So they're a oh. bunch of goofy prudes anyway. Well, you know what? After that, they were fine with this when they, uh, when they got the joke. <laughs> so, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, that hard ticket. And I've watched all of these films because I also have the box set. Um, and uh, everyone out there should buy the box set or wait for the Blu-ray wait, box yeah, set, yeah. which is coming I soon. Think, or, I think January. January. And we're trying to incorporate some of the other, uh, like there's a there's a puzzle that's coming out. Uh, Messed Up Puzzles is doing a, a puzzle with hard ticket with the um, poster and music. Um, that's about, that's, oh, oh, and maybe Andy's autobiography in paperback. Oh, We're trying nice. to work on that. Yeah. I'm gonna, be, gonna, I'm gonna have an Andy Sedaris um Christmas, I guess. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> because I'm because the thing is when I was hunting to get the DVDs, I was like, well, some of them were on Blu-ray, but I'm a collector. I can't just get things. I can't finish the set unless I have the whole set. So it's like they gotta be coming out on Blu-ray soon enough. So I'll get the DVD first. And then I'll get the Blu-ray, and then I'll be a, I'll be a happy camper, and hopefully Sharon doesn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, one question that I've been dying to ask you, especially since I found out we were going to do doing this, and I got so excited I squealed like I was three again. <laughs> Who, how, how do you get Buff Bagwell to do some of those movies? Like, how did that happen? Did his mom call you to set up the <laughs> appointment? <laughs> because well, well for Shane, because well for Shane, because Shane's not as big of a wrestling. Fan but I do know I Buff Bagwell. Yeah, but yeah. The, the whole the whole running gag is that he got fired. One of the reasons why he got fired from the WWE that they're saying is because his mom called out for him. So that's why they fired him. I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> that's not my business. But did did did, you, did Judy Bagwell call you to ask you to put no. her son in your movies? <laughs> no. No, not at all. No, I think that Andy just looked through the, the the wrestlers and said he looks he looks good. He looks like he would be a good uh, person for us as first as a, a villain and then coming back and connecting with Julie and it worked out. Yeah, no, he was great to work with. Yeah, I was going to be my next question. Was he was yeah. he an East cuz this at he this did. point the NW, the the NWO faction was starting to get big and he was starting to get into that but he was still a humble regular dude. Oh, he was he was terrific. But and what was really funny was the um, the makeup girl, you know, for the scene where he's he's lying out and and she has to kind of oil him and <laughs> Andy had to call out her out like four times. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> Stop touching his body. You know? He's not oiled enough yet. <laughs> that's right, right. That's yeah, that's, let's move on. <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> that's so great well yeah. and speaking of buff bagwell you guys ended up working with a lot of people that would go on to do other other big things like danny trejo came up in our uh, news interview oh can you talk a little bit about working with danny well uh, that was another thing where 
he was hired, um, and you know, he looks so mean and, and vicious. Um, and then, you know, he has that tattoo, which I eventually discovered he did himself in solitary confinement. I didn't know that before I hired him. Um, and he was, it was just, he was just great. He was, and he had a sense of humor and, um, you know, and there was one, one thing we were having a tough day with, with some equipment and we had stopped and it's the, it's the scene where he walks into the bathroom with, um, Eric Estrada and, uh, Devin DeVasquez is lying there dead. And he says, um, boss, can I just pop her one? Well, you know, nobody will know. And, and he said, is that, can I use that? And I, I was so tense from other things and I said, no, and I'm so sorry because it would have been pretty funny. I mean, a little you know, <laughs> bizarre, but still funny. Anyway, no, he was, he was terrific. And the other thing that happened was, um, he asked, he had an offer to go back to Los Angeles, like in the middle of shooting. Um, so he could, he could read for with the train. The, what was the movie? The first movie that he did that really catapulted him to start him. The Runaway Train. Is that sure. I, I know he was in Blood In, Blood Out a little no, bit. Another, it was either another. about the same time as yeah, but, his but film with you guys. Yeah, this was the first, you know, big movie. One of his uh, first studio movies. movie that he did, and so he asked if he could leave like on a Friday and come back on a Tuesday. And I looked at the, the schedule and he, he was fine. He was free. That was my first, you know, independent movie producer the role. Nobody else would have said yes, because you don't have to, and you shouldn't because anything can happen. And then he told them production that I didn't know any better. And I said, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was a 1985's Runaway Train. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. right. So that was a big deal for him, as it turned out. And I'm very happy to have, in my uh, naivete, <laughs> been able to help him out. He was he was terrific. Yeah, he's had just he's I just had was, an amazing career. I was just yeah. looking at his IMDb, and I had to scroll forever to get to the yeah. bottom. <laughs> yeah, because his his IMDb is just insane. Yeah. Like, and he's now he's, you know, he's expanded to businesses or restaurants and all sorts of things. And, move, you know, big movies. My goodness. Oh, my goodness. And yeah. what he does, you know, just to help other people is, you know, truly giving back. And I, so I how do... I'm sorry, go ahead, Shane. I was going to ask, how many of those, uh, how many of the folks from these films do you keep in touch with? Do you guys get to see each other or... Yeah, um, there are some, uh, Ava Cadell, uh, Mark Morris, um, Howard Wexler, um, you know, Rodrigo passed away last year, mm -hmm. my, my, he's a good friend, um, Donna, yeah, uh, yeah a lot, uh, Roberta, I had a, a get together, if you look at uh, the website, there are um, segments of the people who came to the, to the, um, so we get together and we, I, you know, we talked about the movies, Richard Cancino, uh, Gary Stockdale, Lisa was there. Yeah. But that, and he said, and you can see these, um, you know, these little clips from our get together. Awesome. Uh, I'm also really interested in hearing about all of these playboy mansion parties that you guys were going to. Yeah. Cause I mean, <laughs> Donna told us the story about how she met you guys. Cause she wasn't going to, they, they had asked her, what, what was it, Shane? They had it was like the Playboy do. Olympics, basically. Yeah, right? she yeah. wouldn't do it. And then they begged her and begged her. And she was like, fine, but you got to give me this, this, and this. We're like, fine, whatever you want. And that's how <laughs> you guys met. So yeah. what was that meeting like from your guys' perspective? Well, Andy was directing that show. Um, mm. Michael Trachillis was the, the producer of those shows. Michael Trachillis and his wife, Melissa, um, produced a number of those um, Playboy events. Uh, as well as the the videos that that Playboy uh, distributed, um, so Andy directed. And Michael and Andy were very very good friends, um, and so uh, Andy directed that. And he was looking for the girls he could cast in these movies, and he was looking not only for them to be good looking, but to be good athletes. And of course, Don is a terrific athlete, and and so. He asked her to interview, and and he hired her. We hired her, maybe. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was his choice. That was, that was it. 
Well, and uh, when we talked on the phone earlier this week, Arlene, you said that you had taken issue with something that Donna said, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to that now, Uh if you'd like. Please don't beat me me up. I had nothing to do with it. (laughs) (laughs) No, and she said, well, as everybody knows, I can't hack my way out of a paper bag, and I take issue with that because I don't think she ever could appreciate the power that she had uh, uh, in front of the camera. The camera just loved her. And Hard Ticket was her first acting experience, and I, don't, I never I'm, would have known. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I I can't imagine anybody doing better than she. I thought she was perfect. No one yeah, should be dominant. Years later, I found out about you know her, her substance abuse and all that, but but boy, she held it together for us every day. She wasn't she wasn't late. Um, you know, she just she performed. She just was. She was. She's good. Yeah, well, and I and I told you that even at that point in her career where she hadn't been trained classically as an actor, like she had so much charisma that that, that more than made up for anything that she didn't have in classical training. Right. Okay. Um, so I asked Donna this, but I'm going to ask you because you were involved in the some of the creative stuff as well and in production. What would Donna Hamilton be doing today, do you think, from your perspective? <laughs> I think she would be overseeing and, and training other young women for uh, for the job. Yeah, no, yeah. she wouldn't give it up. She See, that's what it. I was thinking. Donna yeah. told us something different, didn't she? Oh, she did. Yeah, Donna Donna said that uh, she would be like retired and like living on the beach somewhere and surfing. But She's I think that she... ass for that. <laughs> yeah, I think that. I don't think that no. <laughs> no, right. If Andy wrote it, he, she would definitely be in charge of. And oh, yeah. I think that it's. I think it's. And I totally understand why she wasn't in the last few. Uh, but I do hate that she didn't get an opportunity to be to finish that. That out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we decided to go non-union for a number of reasons, mostly because the unions, you know. Uh, uh, they, we don't have that enough time for that. I mean, they they just never helped us out when when they should have. Right. Um, and so when we had the opportunity to, to opt out, we did, and uh, you know, and that raised some issues in terms of hiring. But that that was what we did. So one question that I have: What was it like working with Pat Morita, and how did you how how did Pat Morita come in? Oh, oh, that was, I guess, oh, Skip Ward, who was a longtime friend of Andy's, who was an actor and then got into producing um, at, at Warner Brothers, actually. Um, uh, uh, what did he do? Uh, so from that, that just the name Pat Marita uh, rose up and, and he was available and he was a name and he would work for a reasonable price. And so we hired him. That was it. <laughs> He was, um, yeah, you had to be careful about him, but, you know, that, and that was, you know, that was one of those things where people would say, you know, you should have name actors, name. First of all, I would say, I don't think there's a, a more well-known name than Playboy Centerfold for one right. thing all over the world. I mean, you know, well, especially that. in the eighties and early nineties oh, like that, they were oh, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And the thing about the girls was that not only were they good looking and well known and well received and people wanted to see them, but uh, because of their work with Playboy, especially Centerfold, they went out on interviews. And so they became comfortable being interviewed and, and savvy about how to conduct themselves. So that was a big help as well when they did uh, promos for us. So that was, that was really good. But Pam Marita was, was, uh, was not my, you know, he was fine. He was a name. Yeah. I feel like these movies, Arlene, are having like a real second life right now. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I'm astounded at it. Well, you know, um, they, they were uh, always represented by Warner Brothers for television throughout the world. And that was very a very good relationship. But television is changing. And last year, oh, I guess it's almost two years, um, the, the American uh, Ag, Agva uh, came to me and said they wanted to make a deal for theatrical distribution, and and I thought, oh, what what? A, I mean, I don't know theatrical 
distribution. That doesn't sound like much to me. And so I was, you know, I'm not so interested. And then they said, we will try, we will upgrade your, your, your uh, releases to HD digital on our dime. Well, so, so yeah. they started to do that and then they were working with my, um, uh, CD distributor that's uh, Mill Creek Entertainment. And and so I said, you know, when you make a, a, a booking, give me the name and address in advance and I'll send a promo package so that they, they can promo the films before they show. And two weeks later, I have 40 bookings and all over the world. And I'm able to do, first of all, I can send everything, I can transmit it digitally. So that means that I don't have to worry about the, the print and the expense and when they'll be coming back and is it going to get damaged, you know, all of that stuff. Don't, no worries on that. But then I can do the Q&As from like this all yeah. over the world. I had one week, I had San Diego, I had um, Canada, and, um, and not Ireland. No, where was it? it was, I was in Sweden. So, yeah, all over the world. I mean, it's hysterical. <laughs> yeah, there's just been this sort of real resurgence lately of of a love for this kind of like cult classic movie, no. you know? Yeah, because they're not getting movies like this anymore. They're, they're not making movies anywhere near like this anymore. Yeah, this yeah. these these things they're such a they're they such a did, texture. <laughs> no, they really didn't. No. I mean they are very unique in in the fact that they are sexy, you know, they're R rated and, and then people who say soft porn and I cringe. Yeah, it's yeah, interesting. Because, because but they're really not. Yeah, they're yeah, really not. They, yeah. they, I mean, topless yeah. topless stuff doesn't equal to soft core. It just doesn't. Like I, I joked with Donna that I would catch some of these movies when I had no business being up at night watching them. Yeah. But the only reason why is just because of the nudity. But the nudity wasn't it wasn't central to everything. Where some of the movies that came out at that time that were shown on, you know, HBO Cinemax in that time slot the nudity and the sex was all that the movie had where these movies mm -hmm. it's it, it's totally different yeah they they're they're able to be sexy without being ob objectifying uh if that makes sense yeah um and like the, the the nudity just always and this is something that we said in our episode about hard ticket the nudity just was always so matter of fact it wasn't right. like it wasn't made to be a big deal you know um right, it's it, just like yeah, lift at the hot tub. I do my best thinking there. That's yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, over and over. Yeah. Well, and you know, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, oh, I no. love that line so much. I love it too because <laughs> I, I do my best thinking when I get in the shower. I mean, hey, yeah. there's just something about water. It is actually probably true. She probably did do her best thinking in the hot tub. <laughs> right. <laughs> I As believe that. that those, those glittery things were diamonds. Ooh. <laughs> I don't um, know if they would have known that. I'm broken. I'm broken. <laughs> are there were there any um, stories that that weren't made into films that you know of? Well, there's there is an unfilmed script. Um, but I don't know if it'll ever get done. You know, I've had people come to me to either do that film or to do a remake or, and, and either they don't get the joke and they want to make it more graphic sex. Right. Or, or about, you know, drugs in dark alleys. And then no, that's not about it. And then we get down to the fine points of negotiation and they say, you know, and of course you'll guarantee completion. And that's, I say, I'm going to guarantee completion. What do I need you for? So, so that, that's, been that. that's been the way it's gone. So, and that never... sucks because I'd love to see a continuation. I mean, I, I, I'm not a big fan of... I, we've had this discussion before about the whole remakes, reboots, and... Why not just we just have a continuation, you know? Well, and... it's, a, it's an agency... You're obviously going to have new recruits and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I... Why, why, why not? That would be so awesome. I just, I, I, the only thing I worry about, I would love to see, I would love to read the script, but I just worry that without Andy, that it, it would, it would be missing that personality oh, and that yeah. texture. Yeah, that personality is. No well, maybe we, we wait for, for our grandson, Basil. <laughs> He's 12. So. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Well, but you know what? Have, I'm telling you, he has Andy's sense of humor. Nice. I see it already. 
scares me, but still. <laughs> well, you know what? If you if you ever were, I would happily be a bumbling moron for the film. <laughs> yes, I can. I can hold play a spot that for the plot of Holics in there. We can. We'll just be and two it, members it, of the media in there. You know. Um, <laughs> well, if you can take a bullet, then then we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, yeah I'm, law, sure. I'm, law, I'm law enforcement trained, so I can do oh, whatever you want oh, me to do. And I'm a first degree black belt in Kempo, so I can do whatever you need me to do. I am none of those things. I'm an English teacher, so. <laughs> um, well, we can use some of that too. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm, uh, which means that I am prepared for active shooter training. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both, and we're both writers, so yeah, we we right. we will be willing to do anything to help with. The Sedaris legacy, yeah. as it were. Uh, yes, consider us for now unofficial historians. Uh, we okay. will we will preserve the the legacy the best of our ability because I think that these these movies are great and I think that they set like a really interesting. Um, I think that they set an interesting trend because I think that a lot of the '90s aesthetic is a result of. The, I think about Baywatch. And I don't think that Baywatch exists as a as a television show without this kind of movie coming before it, you know, um, because the Baywatch aesthetic is very like Malibu Bay film aesthetic. It is. It really is. And I mean, I mean, here's the thing. And this isn't just me just saying this because you're here, because I even said it to Shane in conversation. A lot of the strong female leads that we're finally starting to see now it's almost like they're drawing from some of those influences from, you know, Hard Ticket, Guns, Savage Beat. You know, it, it's drawing from that because these women in these films were the stars. They were the badasses. And, you know, we're seeing that now, you know, with Scarlett Johansson in the MCU and um, even a lot of the stuff that Natalie Portman's been doing over the last few years. We're seeing that badassery, mm -hmm. but it started... 30 years, 30 plus years ago. Yep. And there were people who said, you know, the, that that won't work, you know, women being the, the leads like that. And being, that was, but that was Andy's vision and that was it. Well, and the second life that these movies, that these films are having now, are, it, it, it speaks to the idea that they were ahead of their time, right? I think uh, so. Yeah, because now people are finding them and, and now the culture is ready for that kind of, like I've I've been calling it sneaky feminism, uh, uh -huh. because it it offers a very clear feminist mes message, but it never gets preachy about that. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, because I I said that about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. As much as I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it did get kind of preachy at times, and there would be times where I'd be watching the show. As much as I love the show, it's like, why don't you just ask for help? You need help. Ask for it. No, I don't need anyone's help. You know, no. The the women in these movies. They did what they needed to do. When they needed backup, they called backup. They were still in charge of the show. So yeah. with that being said, are there is there are there any writers or directors that are out in you know out in the business nowadays that you think sort of have like that obviously no one's gonna be like Andy, but sort of have no. that that similar mindset of portrayal of women in their work? You know, it hasn't occurred to me to identify a movie that I've seen as being similar to, to Andy's vision. I don't know, maybe I'm just not, I'm not ready for it, or I, my vision isn't as, as uh, open to it. But no, I haven't, I haven't seen that at all. Well, and I don't know that I've seen it really either. Um, because a lot of films that do have that, that have a similar message get too self important, or like there's something, there's some element of it missing you know um and uh, it just sort of speaks to that uh andy sedaris legacy that there's just no one like him and and who knows no one's there, gonna be no one will ever create anything like that again which means that that script should probably just remain unmade you know um i mean I, i'd I, love I, to, i'd love to read a copy of it though oh yeah. <laughs> see and, and that's my thing too is that if nobody's going to be able to do it the right way in a way that like you would be that honors that 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 honors what you guys did because you guys did this for twelve films. I would it it, it would break my heart if somebody called Ruined himself it. coming <laughs> in. Right, right. Well, that you know, as I said, there have been people who have come to me with ideas, but but they but they don't get it. They don't yeah. get the, what what he was really trying to to communicate to the audience. 
And I wonder. Well, he didn't take himself seriously. That's the big deal. That's the thing, and that yeah, I think is exactly. so important. The snake, the snake for me oh, was snake. that case. Is that he's not taking it too serious. This is about having fun. It's I'm actually movie. really glad you brought the snake up because Donna tells us that you have the snake at your house. Yes, it's it's, it's in the attic. Oh man, I wish oh, that yeah. you had that oh, nearby. My god, that, oh my god, that snake. Yeah, I would. Was, say, oh man. <laughs> when we found that that guy Fred Luff, um, who who created the snake, and then when we were in post production and and we were doing all the sounds and uh, voiceovers and stuff, and I said, you know, that we need something for the snake. I don't know some sound. So we called Fred and said, well, what do you think? And he said, I'm glad you called. I am a snake ventriloquist. <laughs> <laughs> he came, and what he did was, you know, <laughs> basically, which was great. It was exactly what we needed. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah, was, the, he was he, the snake is know, so he, good. Yeah, and, and Andy said, well, how did you start to, you know, creating things like that? He said, well, when I was a kid, I liked to scare people. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this, that's <laughs> career incentive. <laughs> well, the one thing I'm curious about was, Whose idea was it to put in the script that there were no snakes on the island? <laughs> that was Andy's dialogue. Yeah. Are there, are there snakes on the island? I don't know. I'm I mean, I can't them. imagine that there aren't snakes in Hawaii, uh, but I don't know. I'm not an expert. Yeah, I've, I've never I been there. The mongoose will eat the snakes and something like yeah, that. Yeah, mon yeah, mongoose are, a nat are one of the only mammal predators of a snake. I do remember that from science class. Okay. <laughs> so maybe that's why he said, you know, he just said, well, the, the mongoose are too good. <laughs> there are no, there's that no makes thing. sense. Okay. That makes well, sense. Because I'm thinking about it. I was like, is that the way it worked? You know what? Yeah. I am thinking too much about this. I'm just going to have fun. <laughs> um, Arlene, what are you working on now? Well, now I oversee the distribution. And now there have been all the, you know, these offers. Well, first of all, they're streaming. So that's been excellent. And, and more and more people who are asking for licenses. For streaming. Are you guys and, available for streaming uh, anywhere, like included in a subscription? Are you like on Prime or Netflix or anything like that? Or yeah, well, is it... we, we, if you go to our website, you can see uh, how you can stream from there. Also hmm. Mill Creek. And, um, and now Alamo, which is a, the theatrical uh, chain, they're yes. streaming as well. So, awesome. um, yeah. Yeah. I, I hope to find, uh, I have a, an Alamo draft house nearby and I would love to oh, catch yeah. a, uh, a stream, a screening of, of one of those when everything opens back up, you know? Yes, I know, but they would, boy, they surprised me with, with all the bookings that they, that they got. Where do you, where are you? Where are you I'm in North from? Carolina. I live near, uh, uh, Raleigh. There's, there's one in Raleigh. Oh, good. Yep. Yeah. And I live in Pitt. I live in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, uh -oh. Pennsylvania. So. so you definitely have one up there too. I can imagine that you would. I'm sure I do. I and I've done a couple of, of uh, physical, uh, you know, in-person uh, Q and A's in San Francisco and in New York. So, you know, I I travel. <laughs> Yeah. You know, if it makes sense, I'll I'll go anywhere. So, you know. there, right. Yeah. You said well, that you well, love next time, about well, ne well, next time you come to the East Coast and you're in Pittsburgh, let me know. We'll we'll get together. Well, <laughs> if there's if there's a screening, I'll go from New York. Although, who's going to go to New York now? That's a that's another conversation. Oh no. man. Yeah. Right. It's just it's just getting so crazy. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how's how has quarantine been treating you, Arlene? Oh, well, um, I, you know, I'm fine. I have plenty to do since I was in the midst of this renovation and it stopped cold one day with dust every, I mean, just disarray and dust and, oh, it's terrible. So now, uh, the, basically, the, the uh, renovation is finished, but, I mean, there's still more to do. But I'm also thinking about possibly moving to uh, Florida. So now I'm going through everything to, you know, to just, I, I, I was, I just trashed the, uh, my tax returns from, um, what, 2002. So I'm, I got enough to do. And, you know, and then, and then these, you know, I've had some offers for some very interesting merchandising issues that we can incorporate with the release of the, um, of the box set. So that's exciting to me. 
if yeah, that's guys, awesome. If you come up with a, if you guys come out with Funko Pops, you will just make my life. Oh man, what's that? What's Funko that? Pops? Funko Pops. They're um. What's hey, hun, can you bring me a Funko? I have one right it here. It doesn't matter. Basically, they're they're these little vinyl figures that are made of from like all kinds of different pop culture like creations and stuff. It was I totally have, like, Donna needs a Funko Pop. Donna oh, needs sure. a Funko. Like here's. Like, well, I, they should I, call me and make an offer. <laughs> I'm gonna get. Think, I'm, I, I'm gonna email Funko and be like, you I guys think that you can request. I think you can. I think they have a form on their website that you can request figures. So we'll just start a write-in campaign yeah, for because, like hard okay. ticket to Hawaii. Wait, I, have to, I have to write down what it is. Funko. <laughs> yep. Fun. Yeah. The, yeah. The company is called Funko. They're based out of Seattle, Washington. I have so many of them right now that like, I think my collection is worth like two <laughs> grand at this point. <laughs> um well, Arlene, we're going to uh, start to wrap it up here and let you get on with your evening. But just to remind everybody, the 12 film uh, Andy Sedaris collection is available now on streaming. And also there's a digital, uh, there's, the, there's the DVD box set. And soon, in the, within the next six months or so, you'll be able to get all 12 of those films on Blu-ray. Ten of them are available now on Blu-ray, right? Right, and two, are, well, I have the uh, availability for the, the 11th of the 12th, but I'm going to wait to introduce the 12th, and that should be momentarily. So yeah, just and then the box at AndySedaris.com. And also yeah. music from Hard Ticket to Hawaii. It's a whole so yeah. excited. To Hawaii. Yeah. I'm excited. And there's a... There's a ton of other merchandise over there on the website. Uh, it's andysedaris.com. That's it. Now, awesome. Yeah, we we so appreciate you taking the time. Oh, to I, I come love on. talking to you, and I'm really I'm really proud to have been considered. Thank you. Oh, oh well, you know it is it's it's it is our greatest honor. Yeah, uh, the, the, this to, you don't. I don't think you realize how big of a deal this is for us. Well, we, I'm thrilled, frankly. <laughs> we we love it. And uh, and I know that uh, our our listeners have also been uh, flocking to all of this uh, Sedaris content pretty uh, frantically. So I'm, I'm sure that this is going to uh, to please a lot of people out there. So thank you so much for hanging out with us and uh, consider uh, consider yourself to have an open invitation to come back anytime. Anytime. Um, we'll have you back when the Blu-rays come out, when the box set releases. We'll have a listening party for that soundtrack. Okay, uh, okay. Oh, this yeah. great. And I'll, I'll be great. I'll you be singing great. along horribly. <laughs> oh, I'll join you horribly. All right. That's actually that's one of those things that's on my list of things to do in my spare time is to take singing lessons because I love music and I sound terrible. So <laughs> I just want to be okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I I think that at the end of the day. You, you've got so much talent that if you start adding singing to your repertoire, the world's just not ready for that much awesomeness oh, oh in one person. God. Oh my god! <laughs> now, uh, now I have a on. I have a pipe dream of writing a stage musical. What if I approached you to write the stage adaptation musical version of Hard Ticket to Hawaii? There you that go. Would be awesome. <laughs> There you go. That would be that would be something. That would be a ton of fun, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, Arlene, thank you so much again, everybody. Uh, AndySedaris dot com, and uh, thank you so much for hanging out. And we'll talk to you again real soon. Oh, I look forward to it. I've enjoyed it so much. It's great to know you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Plotaholics, ripping plots apart for you. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man.